Welcome back to Mini Magna Overcoming Challenges in Reef Keeping. I'm now honored to introduce to you Dr. Jamie Craggs. Jamie is the aquarium curator of the Horniman Museum and Gardens and co founder of the Coral Spawning Lab. He is presenting with the theme of Overcoming Future Challenges in Reef Keeping with the presentation title of Spawning a New Future for the Industry A Decade of Coral Spawning in Aquariums and Its Potential for Sustainable Coral Production. Jamie is here to speak to us at Mini Magna. Jamie, welcome to Mini Magna. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's great to be invited to speak and, and share my passion for, for coral spawning. So I'm looking forward to the day. I really want to cover some of the work that I've been doing over the last 10 years in, in developing processes to, to spawn corals in aquariums and really how I see this um, playing a, a quite a significant role in supplying new color strains and things like that for, uh, of corals for the aquarium industry in the future. Um, so I'm going to cover uh, some changes in system designs um, that we've been working on over the past decade, um, looking at um, some tips and tricks of, of new species that we've been working on um, to help people try this either, you know, from a commercial point of view or trying it at home uh, from a hobbyist point of view. A little bit of uh, some work I've been doing at home here um, in London uh, or in Kent in England uh, with, my, with my family. Um, and then moving into selective breeding and how I think selective breeding could play uh, the biggest role and the, the, the huge potential of selective breeding. What I'm not going to cover, though, is the specifics on how you go spawning corals uh, to begin with, because um, I've covered this in a couple of Magna talks already. And then earlier this year, myself, uh, Kerry O'Neill and um, Richard Ross uh, produced three different articles, but each focusing on part of the process about how you would spawn corals um, in aquariums, how you would then work with the fertilization, the settlement, and then ultimately the rearing of corals. Um, and we put all this, uh, or we got asked to, to write these three pieces for uh, Coral Magazine in, in January and February this year. And they've produced a, a coral breeding hub, which collates not just this, but other mag magazine articles, online articles, things like that. So this is a real resource for people to tap into to get insights in how they um, would approach spawning corals back at home in essence. So there's lots of information there. So just taking back when I, when I initially started questioning whether it would be possible to spawn corals, this, this is... Um, uh, the behind the scenes area at the Horniman Museum in London. Um, it's a museum that has a public, uh, public aquarium and I'm the curator of that public aquarium. Um, as I should say in this presentation, I'm covering work uh, that I've been doing as part of my job at the, at the Horniman Museum, but also stuff that I've now been doing as part of the Coral Spawning Lab, which I'm gonna go on and talk about. Um, so this is what the systems looked like in 2012. Pretty rudimentary, really. We've been using them um, for quite a lot of coral disease work uh, in the previous, previous few years to this. And we decided, right, we, we want to try and understand what it is that triggers corals to spawn in the wild and, and how we could replicate that in aquarium environments. And we did this on a complete shoestring budget. Um, we got an old GHL microprocessor. We attached that to the systems. And then we built this, this uh, blackout blind uh, so that we can control the light dark environment. Because what we do know is the corals are, are really sensitive to changes in photo period and lunar cycle. And those interactions play a, a significant role in, in triggering them to, to spawn in a really predictable way. And this works really well, considering it was a shoestring uh, budget putting this together, we got the first two Acropora species spawning uh, within eight months of putting this experiment together. So we really knew we were onto something um, in those early days. And then we started thinking, well, we need to advance the technology um, to improve our control over the corals and, and adding more sophistication to water chemistry management and things like that. So that first one we called our Mark One. This was a paper I published in as part of my PhD in, in 2017. Um, which sort of described our Mark III version, as it were. And, and the paper really goes into detail about the environmental parameters that are important in inducing spawning, how we use um, the code with an apex with this system, 
um, coupled with LED lighting to replicate all of these environmental parameters that, that are important to, to spawn corals in, in aquariums. Um, so myself and the co-authors, this, this is the title of, of that research paper, and we published it specifically in an open source journal. And that means anyone can access this. If you just type this, this paper into Google, um, it's not behind a, a paywall, which many research uh, journals are. So anyone can access this. This is the blueprint. Um, if you want to modify your home system or, or develop a system in your, you know, your local fish store or, or do it on a much larger commercial scale. This, this was the sort of blueprint to start all of that. On the back of my PhD, here we have um, Professor Mike Sweet, um, Vincent Thomas at Aquarium Connections and myself. We, we came together just over a year ago to, to form the Coral Spawning Lab. And we really wanted to um, develop the concept of um, spawning corals in a planned and predictable way and make it, in essence, a commercially um, available uh, option. So we started developing different systems uh, to meet clients' needs, uh, whether it be um, spawning corals for research purposes to understand genetics or understand climate, um, you know, the influence of climate change on, on corals. It might be for production of corals for reef restoration or indeed for aquaculture purposes. And we, this is what we call our off-the-shelf system, and it is designed to um, be able to complete the whole pipeline of production from conditioning your brood stock, spawning those brood stock, um, be able to perform the in vitro fertilization, embryo rearing, uh, settling the larvae, and then finally growing out the juvenile corals. Um, and so we've designed this um, quite specifically so that it can be palletized, um, it can be wheeled into a standard, through a standard doorway into a laboratory situation. And so we have um, a brood stock. Um, holding a uh, unit to it, and then this uh, embryo rearing larval settlement and, and grow out uh, module can be bolted on. Uh, so like I say, the com combination of the two allows you to complete that whole pipeline of production. We've then taken this a, a step further to um, design a container lab. Every, uh, a, a fully fitted um, coral spawning laboratory all into a shipping container with the view that this can simply be picked up, put on a lorry, driven across the country, or indeed put on a boat and, and sent anywhere in the world. Um, in essence, within it, it has four spawning systems, and we know now we have the ability to phase shift um, spawning cycles. So that gives the option of production of, of four different spawning uh, periods per year. And again, it, it contains all the systems that are needed for embryo rearing, uh, larval settlement and and grow out. So it's a it's sort of targeted as a you know a ready made laboratory for coral reproductive work. One of the things that I've been you know I've been really passionate about coral spawning. I obviously did uh, well. I did my PhD around ex situ spawning, and after the PhD, I really wanted to um, teach my boys and my family you know how how coral spawn, and so. At the beginning of, of 2020, I had a system put in, uh, the one that's behind me now, um, and ultimately programmed the system to induce uh, multiple spawning starting in October, and we, we finished up in December last year. And we spawned um, five species at home. Um, it's given me a completely different insight in how to manage spawning in a home setting. You know, when I work with coral reproduction at the Horniman Museum, we're obviously in a lab setting. Um, we, the corals aren't necessarily glued onto rock works. They're, they're individually mounted on, on their own stands. And so you can easily remove them and, and uh, move them down into various aspects of the lab. You know, the traditional setup of a home um, aquarium, you obviously can't do that. The corals are, are glued onto live rock. And so I really need to start thinking around how we would harvest gametes um, within our home kitchen system. So, you know, we end up building some of these little gamete collectors just using oil filters that, um, or funnels that we chop the, chop the ends off and then uh, siliconed on these falcon tubes off, off the uh, coral. And then around the base here, we, we just use it um, freshwater plant lead 
and then uh, silicon those in to seal them to make sure we weren't leaching lead into, into the marine system. And these were pretty well. It meant that you could ultimately um, place each one of these over, over the coral that was spawning. It would, uh, you know, they're, they're naturally floating up these egg sperm packages and that would collect them in the falcon tube. And then we would um, take them out of the tank and then do the fertilization on the, on the kitchen table. And then here are my two, two young boys looking at the embryos developing in this little rack system that we built uh, uh, that kind of plumbed into the main system. So you can see here, there's a big blackout tent uh, and this allows us to go in and out. We can still have our family dinners here uh, with the lights on without causing light pollution and mucking up. And I have to say, um, you know, working with coral spawning, this has been one of the funnest um, spawning periods uh, of working and sharing it with the family and letting them see the, the wonder of, uh, of this incredible natural, natural spectacle. So I've got a video here. This is this sort of um, is taken from all the videos we shot uh, at the Horniman Museum over the over the last few years. We know that lunar cycle is really important in triggering corals to reproduce. Um, what we do is we create these blackout uh, tents to stop any external light pollution, and then we use redhead torches and we're looking for this. It's called setting. So this is the moment that the egg sperm bundles that have taken several months to develop inside the coral, they come up to the, the mouth of the coral, ready to be released on those, you know, just the few minutes of it once, once or twice a year. So the work that we've been doing is looking at um, uh, hermaphrodite uh, broadcast spawning corals. So all the croperids are um, hermaphrodites, so they're releasing eggs and sperm in a single package. So what you have is sperm in the center wrapped round the outside are, are eggs, multiple eggs. So with an acropora, it's sort of, it can be from six up to 10 eggs in a package. And ultimately the eggs are filled with lipids. Um, these uh, buoyant, they're almost the buoyancy aid of the package. So because they're positively buoyant, they basically lift the whole package up to the surface. And this is an incredible, evolutionary adaptation. So synchronized spawning, if you imagine a coral obviously can't move to another individual. By releasing all at the same time and the lipids in the, in the eggs taking these packages up to the surface, ocean currents then mix all of this together and then eventually these egg sperm packages break apart and there's a slight delay from release into when they break apart. And that delay allows enough time for the mixing so that fertilization can happen between one individual and the next. Now, wave action normally breaks these packages apart. In the lab, we simply stir them. And then you can see here the package breaking apart with the sperm liberating out and then the eggs separating. So what we do during spawning is we ultimately take the eggs and sperm, we separate them out and we'll have a beaker of sperm from one colony and eggs from another colony. And then we mix and match depending on what the experiment um, needs. We have fertilization, the cells then divide, and this is all happening up at the surface of the water. So with um, acroporids, about four days later, once all these embryos are developed, they form this free swimming larvae. And the larvae then swims out of the water column, dro drops down onto the reef or in an aquarium onto these frag plugs that are conditioned. And then they settle and form the primary polyp. And the primary polyp then goes on to divide, divide and form the colony that we know as the coral. So that's the life cycle of, of broadcast um, spawning corals. And really the, the, the past decade of developing the, the, um, the finesse of the systems means that we've now spawned, I think, 25 species of, of uh, broadcast spawning corals. We've added brooders on top of that, but um, in terms of broadcast spawning um, corals, yeah, 25 species now. The majority of those are, are croperids, uh, but we have over the last few years started diversifying into some of the LPS corals, um, understanding different mechanisms um, you know, as we're going along. So, what I'm going to share over the next few slides is some of these, um, some of the discoveries we've um, made uh, based on different species, uh, which hopefully will help people um, fine tune when they need to be looking uh, for their broodstock to be spawning of different species. So the first one is Acropora microcladus. This is um, you know, the strawberry shortcake coral. It's a, it's a beautiful species. Um, 
it's highly sought after and it, it's a great contender for you know for for spawning work i've been working with this for about five years now and it took me a few years to work out when these things actually spawn because they actually happen much later than the majority of other acaporas on the great barrier reef so uh, over these next few slides you'll see on this top line um, these are sourced from the Great Barrier Reef. It gives you the month at which spawning should happen. And then this NAFM stands for nights after full moon. So we can see here microclays normally spawns anywhere from nine to 14 nights after the full moon. And then the PSS is post sunset time. So it tells you from sunset how many hours after sunset um, those individuals should spawn. And so each species actually has its window of time at which it's evolved to ensure this cross-fertilization. And you can see here six to four hours post-sunset microclader spawns. And this is why it took a couple of years to kind of figure out how uh, this species spawns, because things like Acropora meliopora, normally you'd be looking at two and a half to three hours post-sunset. Um, but this happens much later with microcladers, and that's why we missed it for the first few years. Anyway, we've been cracking this the last couple of years now, and we've got this nicely, nicely sort of nailed down. What's really nice to see is, you know, they have this beautiful blue um, coloration to them as they grow for the first few months. And it's not till they hit about seven months that this adult pigmentation starts developing through. And then eventually, you know, we see that predominant um, adult coloring of that sort of yellow and pink uh, that's characteristics of... Uh, you have microcladus. This was a, a shot I took uh, just a couple of days ago and they are absolutely stunning. So you can see the, the purple pigmentation of the juvenile coloring slowly fading out into the, uh, the adult coloring as, as things are, are progressing. Um, I'll carry on following this individual and we'll see how long it takes for you know, the full adult pigmentation to, to develop and, and the, the juvenile pigmentation to, to change. And this this is, um, it's not unique to microcladus. Um, if we think about Meliopora, for instance, quite often they're green for the first nine months. And then you see that characteristic pink coloring coming in. Um, same is true for Liriope. So, you know, each species has its own little facets that we're slowly understanding through this ex situ spawning. Next species is, is Blastomusa wellsi. I think this is a, a prime contender for um, uh, lots of sexual reproductive work to be done with this species. Um, typically, it spawns around the same sort of time as the majority of acroporids on, on the Great Barrier Reef. So we're looking at seven to eight nights after the full moon and uh, about three hours post sunset. So this is also hermaphrodite. So it releases these egg sperm packages. Um, so you need you know, a, couple of, a couple of individuals to do your cross uh, fertilization work with. We didn't get that many. This is, this is from um, a spawn in 2019 at the Horniman. Um, we didn't get too many settled, but uh, and there's definitely more work that we need to do looking at the settlement queues and then improving the survival after settlement. But um, it's a great contender to work with, I think, for, for aquaculture purposes. Next one, this is um, things I've been playing with uh, at home with my boys. So we've been working with Micromosa, Lord Howanensis, uh, again, we don't have too many, um, but this this was a shot. Uh, the bottom uh, um, bottom photograph here at four months old. This is a, a picture I took just a couple of days ago. We've probably got about thirty or forty polyps um, that are slowly developing. They release these massive egg sperm packages. They're quite messy sometimes. Um, the eggs are much smaller than acroporids, uh, probably about half the size. We're looking at around a two hundred micron egg there. Um, again, a great species, I think, for, for lots of work to be done um, on this. Then the next one is, and is still a big question mark around the spawning. I've been working with a uh, homophilia, former uh, Scholomyer uh, Australis for, for the last couple of years. And really, there's no information about how these guys reproduce. There is a paper around um, a, a Brazilian Scholomyer that was published uh, probably about 15 years ago, and that is actually a brooding species. Um, this is something I've been playing around with at home, um, where I'm slowly trying to document when 
uh, we should start seeing uh, pigmented oocytes, the egg. So you, basically the challenge with this species is you have to sacrifice the whole polyp. So, you know, doing this at home, it's been an expensive learning curve that you buy um, the corals in at set times and literally frag them in half to have a look inside. Um, but eventually this is the process we need to be doing to fine tuning when this species spawn so that we can then capitalize on the sexual reproduction. This is obviously a species that can reach ridiculously high value with some of the incredible um, color varieties that are available in the trade, but it's also potentially a species that's very susceptible to over collection. So sexual reproduction um, will 100% be the future um, for this species to continue in the trade. And I think it's, it's examples like this and using sexual reproduction that shows the power of spawning in captivity and, and how it can support the industry. What we can see from this picture is, is this is um, uh, a broadcast spawning species and it is a hermaphrodite. So we can see the white here is the spermatophore. So this is where your sperm's developing. And then this yellow area is the, is the oocytes. Like I say, I've been working with this for a couple of years now. I've yet to see the spawning, but I'm going to continue working on this over, over the next few years until I, I really crack it. And um, yeah, and hopefully this can be the future, a future Machna talker at a later date. So that sort of laid a little bit of the foundation. Now what I want to talk about uh, for the latter part of, uh, of the presentation is the huge potential uh, for sexual reproduction. And really, we need to start thinking around these, these color morphs um, that could possibly happen as a result of sexual reproduction. So in this slide, I'm just comparing grafted versus something called chimeras, um, and chimeras through selective breeding. So this is the area that I'm going to focus on quite a bit. So grafted corals, we know that um, these beautiful color bleeds that you, there's a piece literally behind me right here. Um, where you see ultimately uh, this, this bleeding of color going through a single colony. Now, grafted, grafted corals, um, really the approach is trying to sort of mimic um, horticultural practice here where you, know, we, we, you can chop the, the top of uh, one plant off, uh, graft on um, a different variety of the same species onto different rootstock. Um, and then ultimately end up with a, you know, a, a grafted um, plant, one where you might have a, a strong root stock that you want to put, um, you know, the, the fruit production part of the plant uh, together. So you're getting the, be the, be the benefits of both of those systems. Now, lots and lots of people are trying to do this by ultimately getting fragments, gluing them together onto plugs in the hope that these bleeds um, sort of transfer across. And the the, this will work in very, very uh, sort of rare occasions, but the vast majority of these simply will not work. And it's, it's down to genetic incompatibility. What you normally find this bottom picture is one genotype uh, will be dominant over the other. Um, so these are two tenuous, um, a cropper tenuous that ultimately this, this purpley blue genotype is, is dominant. It grows quicker and it's smothering this green genotype. This is sort of a, a non-aggressive takeover where uh, the green genotype isn't necessarily getting stung. It's just literally getting grown over by the more rapid growth uh, of, the, of the purple genotype. What typically though would normally happen is it would be an aggressive takeover where one is dominant, it has a much stronger sting and it is ultimately killing its neighbor. So the majority of these grafted attempts simply don't work because of a dominant recessive approach. Now, this is where selective breeding is different. And we can turn again to the horticultural industry to get um, guidance and inspiration. This has obviously been happening for decades with um, flowers. You know, production of new flowers um, happens from different nurseries um, all around the world. And it will be a nursery will have crossbred one with another and created a new color morph. And that color morph um, will be sort of trendy uh, over the next few seasons with lots of people buying. Here we can see a you know, tulip variety. And this happens you know, across all sorts of plant varieties. And I think there's a massive 
amount that could be learned from the horticultural industry if we apply that to selective breeding of corals, um, but also a lot of inspiration from it as well. So what I'm going to talk about is the selective breeding of corals and how we can produce chimeras. So corals actually lend themselves beautifully to this. So when the embryos are formed in the larvae um, and have developed into larvae, the larvae then settle onto a, a substrate, you know, the reef or, a, you know, in our case, um, you know, a settlement plug, and they naturally aggregate together. Bear in mind, each one of these polyps is genetically distinct. It's its own specific individual. But what you see is they aggregate together, but you've got different individuals aggregating together. And then they fuse, or sometimes not. And there's lots of research looking at this, why corals do it, and also the benefit of it. And what we know from that research is by settling together and forming a bigger entity, you are protecting yourself against competition. Uh, you know, there's benthic competition of algae and sponges and all of the negative interactions that might happen. You have the ability to share resources across that entity. And so you can share food. If one polyp's caught um, some food, it gets shared right the way across the entity. And so there's a benefit of aggregating and hitting this critical mass and surviving by aggregating together. However, a whole bunch of amazingly interesting interactions take place within these entities. And it's called the allogeneic response. And this is very much determined by the fact that corals, when they're young, don't have an immune system. And the immune system develops over the course of several months after they've settled. If we look at this example, we have five polyps. Bear in mind, five genetically distinct individuals have formed one entity here. Where you see these stars, you've got polyp three and polyp four, and you actually can see this hard boundary where there's rejection. These two are too uh, genetically um, distant that they can't fuse together to share the same space. So there's rejection going on. The same is true for polyp number one and polyp number two. You see that hard boundary again where these two are incompatible. However, if we now look at polyp two, three, and five, sorry, if we now look at polyp two, three, and five, these are close enough genetically that they've actually fused to form something called a trichimera. Uh, you can get bi -tri uh, bichimeras, trichimeras. So these are close enough that they've now fused together to form this entity. Now, if we were following this, this specific um, you know, group over the course of several months, lots of different uh, things could play out. It could be that polyp number one is actually the most dominant out of the whole thing. And eventually it kills uh, two, three, four, and, and grows out and, and kills number four. It could be that number four is, is dominant, or it could be that two, three, and five are dominant and they kill number one and two. And they carry on as you know, one unit, but with three genetic components to it. And what I'm gonna show now is the potential of understanding this in selective breeding. So here's a couple of examples where this fusion has taken place. So we've got a cropper tenuous where we've got a, a kind of brown variety on the left and then a purple variety on, on the right. And fusion has taken place where this is one entity sharing two genetic um, signatures within that entity. The same is true with this media pora. We have a, um, a colony here. The, bear in mind, this would have started with, um, the tenuous example would have started with two, two larvae settling together, uh, forming that primary polyp, uh, two primary polyps. They fuse together and eventually they've divided to form you know, this bichimera colony. And so the same is true for this media pora. We've got one colony here that would have been one polyp. We've got another colony here that would have been another polyp. And then we've got this colony here, that which would have been the third polyp. Now, these two have fused. They've accepted each other. But what we see along this boundary is um, competition. It's non-aggressive competition. But this colony here is clearly growing faster and overtaking uh, the, the colony next to it. Now, it could play out that as the, the, um, the immunity 
uh, the immune response develops and kicks in with this example of the meliopora, it could be that this one becomes the aggressive one, kills everything else on this plug, and you end up with one colony. When we follow this through, you end up with some really interesting things that, that can then develop off the back of it. When we look at this colony at the top, so these are all, uh, actually these, these top pictures are all the same colony. We have the, the again, this beige uh, colony on, on the left and the purple on the right. Where the polyp grew on the boundary between those two genetic individuals, the branch grew up and actually divided straight down the branch, half of it with the coloration of one genotype, half with the coloration of another genotype. And then when you follow that through over time, what happens is it creates these natural bleeds going through the colony. And it's exactly this that I think has the huge potential for the aquarium industry. But there's more, I'm gonna fill in on that more. Here's the example of Meliopora where they haven't fused and they've just maintained this boundary where there's no bleeding of the color morphs going through. So we have the green variety on the left and the pink variety on the right, and they will always remain um, pink and green. They will never fuse through. And this is really the example of, of where you're trying to force grafting. You are trying to push the genetics in a way that it simply can't, it can't do. So it's only through sexual reproduction that we can actually um, have the best chance of, of creating these fusions uh, and these color bleeds through selective breeding of chimeras. But how can we go about doing that? Um, how can we specifically select for new color varieties? Well, really it's all about genetic compatibility. And we know this from organ, human organ um, transplantation. Generally you look at blood types to make sure the organs from the donor into the recipient uh, as closely matched so that the, the organ transfer will take place. Well, the same is true for corals. I'm gonna go through an example here of how we could actually start selectively breeding to give us the best chance of creating these, these new color bled chimeras. If we look at this example, on the left-hand side, we've got eggs. On the right-hand side, we've got sperm. And we've got four different um, color varieties of coral. And in this example, all we've done is we've allowed all four of those to spawn together and they've all mixed their gametes together. Now the output of that is a few of those will be fully related. Some of them will be half related, but the vast majority of those will be completely unrelated. And when we start then thinking about this genetic incompatibility, we're forcing it into a situation where once they've settled, they're more likely to fight one another when their immune system develops. In this next example, if we just took eggs from the red, uh, red color strain and we mixed it with sperm from these three um, color strains, the output of that would be a few, again, would be fully related, but most of them would be half related because they'd all have the same mother, but they potentially could have three different fathers. And so most would be half related. And again, we're looking at this genetic incompatibility. Finally then, to selectively breed, what we need to do is make sure that they're all fully related. So if we separate the eggs from one colony and just use the sperm from another, what we know is they are all fully related. They all share the same parents. And what we then see with the, the youngsters is some will inherit the mother's uh, coloration, some will inherit the father's coloration. But what you're also mixed with is because of their so genetically similar, you end up with a high proportion of these being chimeras. And this is, I think, the power of captive breeding and selective breeding as we move forward. But it gets even better than this. This is something we are actively working on at the Coral Spawning Lab. Um, and we're calling them our conservation chimeras. Because what we want to do, this is, you know, I'm sort of launching this now and, and telling people about this now. Over the next few years, we want to auction all of the chimeras that we produce to uh, hobbyists. And the money from that is going to go into a conservation pot. And as that conservation pot builds up, what we want to do is support young scientists developing these types of practices in the field, whether it's Indonesia, Australia, Fiji, wherever that may be. 
that's what this conservation pot is going to be for. And so if you keep um, you know, in touch with our website, this is what we're going to develop over time um, with the view that we support the next generation of people taking this, this science on to the next level. This is another facet now, is thinking around something called interspecific hybridization. And this is an example of a, a, um, a breeding or a spawning that we had at the end of 2019 at the Horniman Museum and Gardens. And what you often find with spawning is you will sometimes just have one individual of that species spawning, and therefore you can't do any fertilization work. The, these corals won't self-fertilize themselves. They have to mix with um, a different individual. When you have those, uh, those, um, those times where just a single genotype um, spawns, that gives you then the option, rather than just throwing the eggs away and the sperm away, to try hybridization between different species. And that's exactly what we did. And we've done, we've probably tried about 80 different crosses of various permutations within a cropper's. Now the vast majority of these don't work, they're incompatible, but you do get some that will, um, that will stick as it were. And so this just showed you what we did in 2019 to create um, a hybrid between Meliopora eggs and we took staghorn sperm. So at this top um, example here, this is what, um, this was an Meliopora Meliopora cross. It wasn't these two specific colonies, that's obviously the same picture. Uh, there were two different Meliopora colonies. Oh. There were two different Meliopora colonies. And what we do is we take a photograph about two hours after fertilization is finished, because then what we do is as the cells are dividing, we can count the proportion of eggs that have divided compared to the ones that haven't divided. And then that gives you your percentage fertilization success. And you can work out you know, how compatible one is and one isn't. Whenever we're doing these hybridization, we always create a self-fertilization blank. And that is we'll take the eggs and sperm from just that same colony, we'll leave it in the test tube, and then we'll photograph it. And by using that self-fertilization blank, we know that we haven't got sperm contamination. And therefore, what we're looking at from the hybridization is a true um, measure of the fertilization success of that hybrid. And so we can see here where we've done the self-fertilization blank for the mealy, we've got 0% fertilization. The same is true for the stag, staghorn um, uh, self-fertilization, 0%. But then when we produced um, Meliopora eggs and mixed it with staghorn sperm, we got a 17.14% uh, fertilization. Now that's really low, and it means that you have to work really hard during the embryo stages, the embryo rearing stages, to make sure that you get clean eggs coming out or um, larvae coming out of it. We then settle those and have been growing those out and this is what um, now that hybrid is looking like. So on the left-hand side, this is a Mediapora, Mediapora pure. And this is typically what we would expect a Mediapora to look like. On the, on the right-hand side here, we can see where we've got the Mediapora eggs, but it's been fertilized with the staghorn sperm. And we can see this really interesting blue coloration that seems to have come from the paternal line um, from the staghorn. Um, whereas the growth structure at the moment potentially is looking a little bit more like Mediapora. This is now 15 or 16 months old. We still got to grow this out to see what this is going to look like. But again, it highlights the potential that this might have for the aquarium trade in creating new color, um, color varieties and growth forms uh, coming into the trade using hybridization. And finally, the last thing I want to focus on is something that we call intergeographical hybridization. So what we've been doing over the about the last four or five years, and this is purely for research um, side of things, but again, I think this has massive potential for the aquarium trade. We have moved the spawning of one geographical location to make sure it matches up with a different location. And we, we have broodstock from Singapore, which normally would spawn in March and April but we moved the spawning to match up with Australian spawning. And then that meant that we then have genotypes from Singapore and Australia spawning at the same time. And we can start taking uh, Singapore eggs and fertilizing it with Australia sperm and vice versa. And this is a paper that we're looking at from a climate, um, you know, climate change and bleaching point of view. It's under review at the moment, hopefully it'll be out soon. 
But what we then, from our side of things, is we're looking from the science of it. So we, we want to try and understand what happens if you then take those juveniles that are produced, thermally stress them, and then take samples to look at the genetic code of inheritance from Singapore, which is traditionally a much hotter uh, location and a reef compared to an Australian reef. So we're thinking about it more from the, the, the research that can come out of it. But I think there's lots of potential for this intergeographical hybridization for the aquarium trade as well. And another example of that is, is something we worked on a few months back in, in London at the Horneman, where we had Indonesia and, and uh, Australian uh, Meliopora spawning at the same time. And we created reciprocal crosses. So we used Australian eggs uh, with uh, Indonesian sperm. We got very high fertilization rates. So there's total compatibility uh, between this, this Meliopora despite um, geographical location. And then we've settled those out. They're now about two, three months old. Um, we've got a lot of growing out to do to see how they will manifest uh, what's called phenotypically. So whether they look different and, and there's lots of experiments that we want to do based on this. And then we also did a reciprocal cross going the other way using Indonesian eggs and Australian sperm. So again, a lot of our work is, is, is focusing on the research side of it and understanding uh, this interbreeding at a genetic level. But I think these three examples highlight the potential for the aquarium trade. So what about the future possibilities? Um, I'm just finishing up now. So think about the future possibilities. If we think about forcing selective breeding to create new color strains, we can put in into geographical hybridization. So moving corals from different locations, moving their spawning seasons to match. And then third, we can also then look at true hybridization, mixing sperm from different species, again, from a different location of the world. And what are the future possibilities of that? And I've highlighted here, Vincent Chalice, um, uh, you know, posted this recently in, in Reef Builders, is Armageddon, um, a cropper tenuous from Indonesia. I mean, what an amazing coral that is. This I think actually is already a true chimera. You can see the bleeding up here. So this has come from, I would imagine a selectively bred, bred um, or this is bred naturally and then fused together. But what if you mix that with an Australian variety here from uh, the ultra coral Australias, um, you know, what would be the possibility of breeding those two together? What would the offspring look like? I mean, literally the world is your oyster when you start thinking about all the permutations of mixing uh, these corals together. And I think that's a really, really exciting opportunity for the future of this. And whether that's done at a commercial level or, you know, people start working on this uh, at home, like I've done here, um, and start exploring where the boundaries of this can go. Um, so I really hope everyone's got some information from this and, and we'll start trying this at, at home and, uh, you know, in the research centers and what have you. None of this work has been possible without so much support from individuals, from companies, from research institutions and from, from grant giving bodies. Um, and I literally cannot thank them enough. Ecotech Marine, Triton um, have been two companies that have supported the work at the Horniman Museum from the very beginning, and I literally cannot thank them enough for, for all their support. There is many people, individuals, and, and uh, like I say, organizations I need to thank, but really importantly is the aquarium team at the Horniman Museum, both past and present, who work tirelessly every day to make sure the research systems still have an output and um, you know, keep this really exciting area of research uh, moving forwards. If you'd like to learn more about that work at the Horniman Museum, you can have a look at the web page there. I've put the, uh, the web page up for the Coral Spawning Lab. Um, there's going to be more information that we um, will be developing coming out of that soon. Um, I set up a Facebook group about six years ago to share um, knowledge around ex situ spawning and spawning in aquariums. And, you know, we, I really hope other people will jump on there and start posting their own successes um, of spawning at home and things like that as, as time goes on. My Twitter handle as well, if, if you're on Twitter, follow me on that. And finally, thank you for listening and thank you so much uh, to the MACNA committee for inv inviting me to speak at this mini MACNA. Um, it's been great. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, I, I was on the edge of my seat the, in, the entire time, and I imagine uh, many of our viewers are as well. Um, if you have any questions for Jamie, please go to macna.org slash questions, um, select Jamie's name and, and start asking them if you haven't been there already, because uh, I'm sure we're going to have lots of them. And Jamie will hopefully be available with the Q&A, although it will be late for him. He'll have a uh, drink in hand and we'll be able to, to ask a lot of questions. Um, yeah, Jamie, I, I have a couple of questions. I know that a lot of our attendees uh, and Mini Macna here are really interested in commercial viability of the hybrids and the chimeras. And we have seen, you know, that, as you mentioned, the grafting. Um, I, I'm going to ask, you know, if we have two species within the same genus, even, are we going to be able to cross uh, those? And you, you did allude to that, the 17.14% uh, uh, ability. And now from a policy point of view, I know some countries only allow certain uh, species in. And I'm just thinking about the, the nightmare that situation is going to become. But I see industry kind of picking uh, that up. And and I'm sure, do you have any more research in that space about the, the hybrids and where is that going to go? Um, so it, it does bring some really interesting questions around um, ethics. Um, you know, uh, the work that we're doing in London, you know, there, there's obviously no risk of corals escaping into the Thames and thriving. <laughs> um, that wouldn't be the same as if you're working in Australia because you're not going to get Indonesian corals, you're not going to get... Fijian corals, and rightly so, because you know that that poses very big risks. Um, so th yeah, there's two separate things here. I mean, I tweeted um, when we were producing these intergeographical inter hybridization, um, and there was there was some interesting conversations that we had on Twitter with various researchers around the world. From my point of view, from the research that we're doing at the Horneman, we are um, trying to understand at a fundamental genetic level where inheritance rely. Uh, um, you know, occurs. And by creating these very extreme situations, does it help fine tune what you need to be looking at in situ? Uh, so if you were looking at, you know, genetics on the Great Barrier Reef. So they provide us a really unique opportunity to study, um, you know, quite extreme situations um, in aquarium environments not something that you'd advocate doing in Australia. It's not something that AIMS, for instance, would be doing in Australia. Hybridization, though, has been going on and lots of research for many, many years. We know this happens. There's lots of discussions about the evolutionary advantages of that um, from you know, an evolution of the species point of view and what are, what are species? That's another question that uh, <laughs> a big, spe a big uh, question around corals. I think... Um, from, you know, from the aquarium trade point of view, I mean, we've already had plenty of examples of this from the fish side of things. You know, we, we, you look at what clownfish breeding is like now. Will corals be there? Yes, they will. I, I have absolutely no doubt that as people progress with this, um, that will be the future of, of, uh, of the industry. Not the whole future, but there will be a, a, an area of it that will, people will want those selectively bred corals um, where it goes, I really don't know. I mean, it, that's the exciting thing about it. Every new spawn, every new cross you try and do, you learn something completely new about it. And, and that is, that's great. That's an exciting, and that's what science should be. It should be exciting. Sure. I'm, I'm just giddy with excitement about you know, the next 10, 20 years of, of what not only MACNA will look like, but all of the marine aquarium industry in general. And let me just kind of reiterate the fact that that, that base paper that um, you have as an open access one is freely available to everyone. I'll, I'll link it uh, here in mini MACNA and it'll be on uh, MACNA's Facebook and social media as well. But we can use that as a base then to you know, have industry do this. And is this capable? All of this is, is available for industry to kind of pick up and hobbyists to pick up right now and start doing what you're doing even in your house, uh, in their own homes? Uh, absolutely. You know, there are so many highly dedicated acris out there that will already be doing some unbelievable work around fish, fish breeding. Um, the skill sets are already there, I think. Um, so, yes, I think people will be taking this up. When I was writing this talk, I, I didn't know whether to sort of, you know, focus on the climate change aspect. But what we have to confront is the fact that reefs are changing. And they're changing very rapidly and we are losing reefs and it's directly driven by increasing CO2. Now, all of the predictions are that isn't going to slow down very soon. 
And so if we are thinking about it from a realistic point of view for the trade, at some point, more and more places are going to be restricted on extraction practices. So the industry is going to have to evolve because whether it happens in 10 years or 30 years time, it will become impossible to take a coral out of the wild because the corals are disappearing. Um, and so we need to sort of really have a word with ourselves. And I think, you know, there's lots of people having those discussions. And, you know, the industry is, is amazingly adaptable um, and will continue for sure. And it will continue in different ways. But it's, it would be wrong to think that you can carry on going the way it has done for the last 20 years in the next 20 years, because it won't. And so we need to be thinking about exactly that right now and putting uh, practices in place to steer it in the direction that we, we want. You know, don't get me wrong, spawning corals is hard. Um, I think Kerry um, summed it up beautifully in, in, her, in the, the, the first line of her um, article in, in Coral Magazine. There's spawning and then there's the day after. Because so, you put all this work into spawning and actually that's the easy bit. That's the bit that just starts you on the process. Once the corals are spawned, that's when the really hard work um, kicks in. And there's lots we need to learn about that. We need to increase productivity for sure. Um, so that you know, you're not producing a hundred corals from one spawning, you're producing your 10,000 corals from one spawning. I think there are, you know, and, and lots of my work post PhD is very much focusing on that. It's how can we increase productivity uh, post spawning? And there's lots of work that can be done on that. And there's differences with every species. So there's, there's a huge amount of work to do, but also a lot of exciting work. That's, uh, and there's going to be so many questions, Jamie. And I just want to remind everyone, macna.org slash questions. Uh, Jamie will be at the Q&A. Um, we look forward to seeing what's coming out of the Coral Spawning Lab in the future. And we'll definitely have you back uh, in virtual macnas and physical macnas in the future. So uh, keep on uh, following what Jamie does and will do in the future. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you again for inviting me.